Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Mark, and I'm an alcoholic. Let's turn to page 72, chapter 6 into action. I want to stress this again because it's important. Chapter 6, Into Action, uh, took me about five years to understand that into action meant into action. <laughs> and uh, there are seven steps in these pages, about 17 pages. But the big book spent 53 pages on just looking at the first half of the first step. I think it's real important that you all understand why it's done that way. Because I do all the rest of the work in this process as a result of the truth that I see in the first step. Okay? And some of you that, that, that are perhaps new a little bit to this experience have probably had the realization that you've been around AA and maybe never understood the first step. And your responsibility when you're working with new people is to do what I've done here, which is show you precisely, go through and take a hard look at that first step, use the book, turn statements into questions, find your own answer deep down within based on your experience to answer the question. Am I powerless over alcohol and is my life unmanageable? Is lack of power my dilemma and do I need to find God? And then approaching the third step and and, uh, uh, meeting the requirement that my life run on my will won't work. I'm always in conflict with the world. And then we went ahead and we looked at the root of our problem, selfishness, self-centered. And then our dilemma is above everything. If we can't get rid of that, we're dead. And there's nothing we can do to get rid of that. I'm chained to me and I can't do anything about it. So I got to find God. How I find God is to quit playing God. And the reason I got to quit playing God is it doesn't work. I don't have the power to be God. I only have the power to be Mark. Then I, then we looked at our third step decision, which is a decision only. God's going to be director, principal, father, and I'm going to be actor, agent, and child. And then we looked at a whole bunch of prayers. Then we spent some time and we looked at that prayer and we saw three ideas in the prayer. The first is that we offer ourselves to God to build with us, do with us as he wants. The second is we ask him to remove us from the bondage of self because we can't. And the third is that we tell him basically that if he'll remove our difficulties, we're willing to go out and bear witness to those we would help of his power, his love, his way of life. And we saw that there's no amen behind that prayer. And now we get it get down to what the book calls the root of our problem. We're going to get, look at the causes and conditions. We're going to look at the things that have us blocked from God. We were told in the final analysis, deep down within ourselves, the only place we find God, and the way we do that is to search fearlessly. So in our fourth step is where we begin the work to search fearlessly. And what we do is we write three inventories, a four-column resentment inventory. And you saw where in the first three columns, what looks to be the truth by the time I write my fourth column has now become a lie. And we talk about a changed attitude and how to view people and understand that people are spiritually sick just like us and no one ever really intentions, intentionally harms us. We harm others based on being spiritually sick. We make mistakes because we're spiritually sick. And we looked at the idea of fear and how much fear dominates our life. And once again, we don't have any power to get rid of the fear. And then anytime I'm in fear, it's because I'm into self-reliance. And we're given some tools to help us get out of fear, which is to ask God to remove it. And he will remind us of what we will, what we would be, his child, actor, and agent. And then we looked at a thing called a sex inventory. And it looks going into it like it's going to be an inventory about me and the opposite sex, but it turns out to be a whole lot more about that. And I take a look at my action, my conduct, and I have to make another list again of people, and I answer nine questions. And I do that to come out of with an ideal, a sane and sound ideal for my future sex life, it says. But the book tricks us a little because it winds up being more than that. It winds up being a sane and sound ideal for what I'm willing to bring to the table in every relationship with every human being that I've ever had. So then we get done looking at that. And now we're into chapter six, into action. Having made our personal inventory, what should we do about it? It says we've been trying to get a new attitude. That's step two. A new relationship with our creator, step three. 
and to discover the obstacles in our path, step four. In inventory, we're going to discover the obstacles that have us blocked from having a relationship with God. We've admitted certain defects. We've ascertained in a rough way what the trouble is. We have put our finger on the weak items in our personal inventory. Now these are to, about to be cast out. This will require action on our part, which when completed will mean we've admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our defects. This brings us to the fifth step in the program recovery mentioned in the preceding chapter. This is perhaps difficult, especially discussing my defects with another person. I think I've done well enough in admitting these things to myself. Well, there's doubt about that. In actual practice, we usually find a solitary self-appraisal insufficient. Many of us thought it necessary to go much further. I will be more reconciled to discussing myself with another person when I see good reasons why I should do so. The best reason first. If I skip this final step, Rich, I may not overcome drinking. <laughs> time after time, newcomers have tried to keep to themselves certain facts about their lives. Trying to avoid this humbling experience, they turn to easier methods. It's going to start talking to us about our take it to the grave, the stuff we're ashamed of, guilt, shame, and remorse. And it's important to pay attention here. It says almost invariably they got drunk. Having persevered the rest of the program, they wondered why they fell. What they're talking about is people who went through and did all this work, but there were segments in their inventory that they left off and they wouldn't tell anyone. And the warning is that having persevered the rest of the program, they still wound up getting drunk. It says, we think the reason is they never completed their house cleaning. They took inventory all right, but they hung on to some of the worst items in stock. They only thought they had lost their egoism and fear. See, the only there's two reasons I won't tell you my stuff. My ego and fear. All right? They only thought they had humbled themselves, but they had not learned enough humility, fearlessness, and honesty in the sense we find it necessary until they told someone else all of their life story. Let me smash another myth in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've actually had people I've done the work with, I'll say to them, what kind of inventory did you do? Well, my sponsor had me write a life story. The way we write a life story is we write a resentment inventory, fear inventory, sex inventory, share that with someone, and our life story comes out. We do life so you do life stories with therapists. That isn't what the book asks us to do. But we wind up telling our life story using the three vehicles that the big book calls inventories. Now I think this next paragraph sums us up not only when we're out there drinking and using. But in Alcoholics Anonymous, dying from a spiritual malady. Think about this. More than most people, I lead a double life. I'm very much the actor. To the outer world, I present my stage character. This is the one I like my fellows to see. I want to enjoy a certain reputation, but I know in my heart I don't deserve it. The men and the women that I've done the work with in Alcoholics Anonymous, I allow them to see me and every single one of my defects. I don't want to go around presenting to them that I've done this work and all of a sudden I don't make mistakes anymore, that I don't lie anymore, that I don't harm people anymore. My sponsor let me see his humanness, and I let everyone I work with see my humanness. You understand? I don't present the stage character to the world anymore. You spend some time with me in any environment I'm in, you get me. You don't get a stage character, and you don't get me at meetings of AA. I'm sorry, you don't get the stage character at meetings of AA. You get me. I'm not going to walk into AA all the time and tell you my life is perfect. I'll walk into AA and tell you that I've suffered greatly in personal relationships, and struggled in career, and had financial problems, and physical health problems. I think that's important. I think new people, people coming into AA, they need to understand something. I'm always going to be a human, folks. I'm stuck with that. And I'm always going to be trying to grow spiritually and make progress. But I need to show you both sides of the coin. I remember one time going to Don, because you hear an AA, make a list of your assets. And he never asked me to do that, and I was kind of hurt. So I went to him, and I said, Don, I hear people in AA, the sponsors tell them, make a list of your assets and liabilities. He said, Mark, you're not going to get drunk because of your assets. You're going to get drunk because of your liabilities. 
Mm, that makes sense. So I think this is important. Think about this if you've been in AA for a period of time. How often in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous do I present a stage character? Hmm. Wonder what that's about. Fear and ego, that's what that's about. Talks about the inconsistencies made worse by the things I do in my sprees. We can have sprees of untreated alcoholism with no booze in us, too. Coming to my senses, I'm revolted in certain episodes I vaguely remember. See, the first inventory I wrote was easy. I could justify all that behavior I looked at based on alcohol. The ones you write in recovery get a whole lot harder. <laughs> I'm going to meetings carrying this mess. He's talking about God, and I'm screwing this person over. They get a lot harder to look at. You see? These memories are a nightmare. I tremble to think someone might have observed me. As fast as I can, I push these memories far inside myself. I hope they'll never see the light of day. I'm under constant fear and tension. My secrets keep me under constant fear and tension. That makes for more drinking. Psychologists are inclined to agree with us. We've spent thousands of dollars for examinations. We know of a few instances where we've given these doctors a fair break. We've seldom told them the whole truth, nor have we followed their advice. Unwilling to be honest with these sympathetic men, we were honest with no one else. Small wonder many in the medical profession have a low opinion of alcoholics and their chance for recovery. Now make a note in chapter 5 how it works. We were given an instruction that said this manner of living demands rigorous honesty. And this paragraph is trying to talk to us about if we're not honest, people in the medical profession realize that an alcoholic has to get honest if he ever expects to recover. But they've had enough experience with us to know that we're pathological liars, so their opinion is most alcoholics or addicts are not going to recover. Now look at the next sentence, and this can be a great promise. I must be entirely honest with somebody if I expect to live long or happily in this world. Maybe a promise in there is, if I'm willing to be entirely honest with somebody, I can either expect to live long, or at least for the length of time I'm here, be happy. Now I'm going to get instructions on who to do this fifth step with. Rightly and naturally, I think well before I choose the person or persons, plural. Some of you have been around for a while. You want a great experience. Do what I'm doing this time. Do an inventory. Do a fifth step with two or three different people. See, when I go back through the work every time, I go back through the work with different people because I'm looking for spiritual growth. I've had basically one sponsor, but I've done a lot of work with a lot of different people. But if you've been around for a while, if you're like me, I have a harder time seeing truth. So maybe consider next time through the work doing fifth steps with a couple different people, person or persons. It says those of us belonging to a religious denomination which requires confession must and of course will want to go to the properly appointed authority whose duty is to receive it. Though we have no religious connection, we may still do well to talk with someone ordained by an established religion. We often find such a person quick to see and understand our problem. It says, of course, we sometimes encounter people who do not understand alcoholics. Now, if we cannot or would rather not do this, meaning go into a man of the cloth, we search our acquaintance for a closed mouth and understanding friend. So now I'm getting some criteria for who to do this with. person needs to be closed mouth. They need to be understanding. They need to understand this is an intimate and confidential step. Goes on to say, it says, perhaps our doctor or psychologist will be the person. It may be one of my own family, but I cannot disclose anything to my wife or parents which will hurt, hurt them and make them unhappy. I have no right to save my own skin at another person's expense. Such parts of my story I tell to someone who will understand yet be unaffected. That's an important criterion who you do your fifth step with. Understand, but who will be unaffected. Look for people who've had some of your experience when you do your fifth step. Example. I basically, drinking, was a slut and a whore. I like, that's all, that's the only way I can describe myself. I'd like to find another word, but those are the two best words. For me to do a fifth step with someone in that area who's been married to the same woman for 30 years, I don't think so. 
I need to do a fifth step with someone who's had my experience and isn't doing that anymore because of their relationship with God. I tell my stuff to one man who's been married to one woman for 30 years in his eyeballs to get just like this. Why? Because he would be affected by what I'm telling him. That's why. Men that have been spent time in the penitentiary do not go find a white middle class Anglo Saxon who's never spent time in the penitentiary to do your fifth step with. Because when you talk about some of that stuff, he has no frame of reference. That's why. His eyes will go like this too. You see, see what the book's trying to say? Who I do this with is real, real important. Because in my fifth step, we're going to hear a little bit further on, this fifth step is life and death. What's life and death is I must see truth. I <clears throat> I don't care who I do a fifth step anymore, but there's certain criteria they need to have. They need to be men and women in this program who've done this work because their whole role is to help me see truth, to move me out of blame, to book, move me out of the victim. It's only through seeing truth that I can get free. So that's what I'm looking for when I do a fifth step. I'm not looking for somebody to pat me in the back and say, oh, you're forgiven, Mark. I want somebody to help me see the truth. See me, help me see the truth in my fourth column. Same thing with my sex inventory. Same thing with my fears. So it goes on to say, the rule is I must be hard on myself, but always considerate of others. Notwithstanding the great necessity for discussing myself with someone, it may be one is so situated there's no suitable person available. If that's so, this step may be postponed only, however, if I hold myself in complete readiness to go through with it at the first opportunity. I say this because we're very anxious that Mark talk to the right person. Now I'm going to get some more instructions for who I do this with. It is important that he be able to keep a confidence that he fully understand and approve what Mark's driving at, that he will not try to change Mark's plan, but Mark must not use this as a mere excuse to postpone. When Mark decides who's to hear his story, Mark wastes no time. I have a written inventory and I am prepared for a long talk. Now I'm gonna get some instructions. Whenever I do a fifth step with someone, we read from the big book where it starts talking to me after I'm done with inventories right up to here. Why? Because I'm showing them what I did, and when they sponsor people, they will show them what they did. And at this point in time, here's what the book says. I explain to my partner what I'm about to do and why I have to do it. Next Wednesday, when I'm doing a fifth step in California, I will explain to Joe what I am about to do. Here's what I'm about to do. I'm about to share three inventories with him. A resentment inventory, a fear inventory, and a sex inventory. Because I'm blocked from God. And if I'm blocked from God, I'm going to be dead. And it says, why do I have to do it? That's why I have to do it. I have to do a fifth step so that God can remove from me the things that have me blocked from him, myself, and you. So that's what I'm about to do, and that's why I have to do it. Look at the next sentence. If you don't think who you do a fifth step with and you don't think who your sponsor is, is important, look at the next sentence. I should realize that I am engaged upon a life and death errand. You have a right when you are asking someone to sponsor you to ask them a lot of questions. You are talking about your life. If someone has been sober for a long time doing that in the middle of the road, God bless them. But that don't work for me. I'll die in middle of the road solution. So I ask people a series of questions before I do a fifth step. I did not assume this woman who'd been sober 19 years in Louisiana, I did not assume because she was 19 years sober that it was okay to do a fifth step. I asked her a whole bunch of questions. Things like, you have a sponsor? Yeah. When was the last time you went through the work? See, she's going through the work with me in a group this time. Eight women and myself. That's an interesting dynamics. Tell me God doesn't work. I asked her if she'd made all her amends that she was consciously aware of. What else did I ask her? I asked her if she sponsored people. I asked her if she had a home group. 
Those are the kind of questions I ask. And if she gave me answers different than what she gave me, I would not do a fifth step with her. Because God could not use her to help me see the kind of truth that I need to see. So this is a real important part. Who you do the work with is critically important. This is my personal opinion. Every single problem in the fellowship today can be solved by great sponsorship. There's In that circle and triangle. When the three legacies were passed down to Alcoholics Anonymous, from everything I can tell, the order in which they were passed down was number one was individual recovery. Number two was the unity, and number three was service. You know why? If I'm not in individual recovery, all I'm taking to my home group is all my defects of character. I'm not taking recovery. Now i got sick groups. Sick groups can't be of service. So the most important key piece is my own individual recovery. And since I can't go through this work on my own, and I want to go through with someone, I'd like to make sure it's someone who's done this work and not middle-of-the-road solution. Goes on to say, most people approached in this way will be glad to help. They'll be honored by our confidence. So I pocket my pride and go to it, illuminating every twist of character and every dark cranny of the past. Now, I'll just share with you how I do a fifth step. I will have the person reading the fifth step to me. Give me the first column, the second column, and the third column. I always have a notepad. I ask God to help me show them see truth. When we're done looking at the first three columns, which they perceive to be truth, I take the first resentment inventory and I go back and I review that page and a half of instructions before you move into the fourth. And I do that one time and one time only. My sole function in that fifth step around resentments is to help them see where they're at in the fourth column, where are they at fault, and to get free of all those resentments. That's my role. That is my sole purpose. When I'm done with that, we read the instructions on the fear inventory, and then I have them read the fear inventory, all the fears and why they have the fears. And then we get to the sex inventory, and we read the instructions out of the book, and then I have them tell me their sex inventory. And then out of that, we're looking for some sane and sound ideals to come. Now, I told you something. When someone wants to give you inventories other than what's in the big book to ask them the question, if I use your inventory, will I get seven promises that have been experienced by millions of people? Here's the promises. We never talk about these in the fellowship. They are some of the most powerful in the entire book. It says, once I've taken this step, withholding nothing, highlight withholding nothing, that's take it to the grave stuff. I am delighted. First promise, I can look the world in the eye. Second promise, I can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Third promise, my fears fall from me. Fourth promise, I begin to feel the nearness of my creator. Fifth promise, I may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now I begin to have a spiritual experience. In the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, we do not begin to have a spiritual experience until we do a fifth step. If you've never done a fifth step, you are not having a spiritual experience. You are having and operating on certain spiritual beliefs, which is why we're asked to say the prayer, God, give me your protection, abandon with complete protection. Those of you who are in this room that never done a fifth step, you are sober through God's grace, love, and mercy. He's giving you protection and abandon. But I'll give you a little warning a friend of mine shares. This is not in the book. Here's what he says. Once I see truth, I don't know how much longer grace is available to me. Meaning, once I've seen the truth in my first step, and I've seen how this works, if I put this off, I don't know how much longer grace is available to me. You understand what I'm saying? Second step, I commence spiritual growth. I do not begin to have the spiritual experience till I have completed my fifth step. Fifth step. Quick little story about inventory for those of you who are going to bulk writing it, and we all will, but this helps me write inventory. How many of you got kids in here? Okay, almost all of you. If you said to your kids, go down and clean your room, would they go down with great excitement and enthusiasm? How about this? Say to your kids, got a deal for you today, son or daughter. You go down to your room, 
and everything in your room you don't want anymore, you pull out, and I'm going to take you down and buy a whole new stuff. They run over you to get to the room. What do you think happens to us in inventory? I go into my room, I take all this junk, all these defects, and I take it to God, and he gives me all new stuff. I take my dishonesty to him, and he gives me honesty. I take my lack of faith to him, and he gives me courage. See what I'm saying? How do you not get excited about writing inventory? The men and women I got sober with get excited when they write inventory. I get excited when I write inventory. What do you hear in AA? Oh, God, I'm writing inventory. <laughs> How do you not get excited that God's going to take all that stuff away and give you brand new stuff and give you more new power? You see what I'm saying? Sponsorship. I had a sponsor that said, get excited about inventory, man. It's the stuff that blocks you. It's gone. You're free. You got freedom. Wow. Wouldn't it be nice if we were giving everybody an AA that message instead of the message we give them? Oh, inventory is a dreadful thing. It reminds me when I had a bisectomy. I got to share this. Men who've had bisectomies lie to you about the results of that. I asked several men. Did it hurt? No, not at all. No big deal. They lied to me. Three, <laughs> three days later, all my privates are jet black. I go running back to the doctor and said, what the hell is going on? We lie to people about the effects of what can happen with inventory. Geez, where the hell did that come from? <laughs> yeah. So, we may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. Another promise. Another promise. Feeling the drink promise disappeared will often come strongly. Another promise. We feel we're on the broad highway walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Now, the next time someone comes up and lays a bullshit inventory on you, not out of this book, you open your book up and say, tell you what I'll do. Be happy to use it. Will, it get, will these things happen? I don't think so. You know why these things happen? My experience, I believe this book to be divinely inspired. You know why? I'm a drunk like Bill Wilson. He ain't got the brains to put this together. This is a path of spiritual exercise designed to get me close to God, myself, and you. No human being's got the power to write this thing. That's why I believe we get the promises when we do the inventories in this book. Now, we're not done yet with the fifth step. We have some more instructions. And you remember that stuff on page 17? We talked about cement and mortar and sand and then the stones and all that. Now, imagine reading this page. And not having gone through the work, you'd think an idiot wrote this book. Here's what it says. I leave my sponsor's house, I go home. Returning home, I find a place where I can be quiet for an hour. Now, my book does not say 42 minutes or 93. It says an hour. So, at this point in time, I follow instructions. I set a timer for an hour. I carefully review what I've done, meaning my inventory. I don't read it again. I just kind of sit and I just think about it. Now, here's what's interesting. Look at the next sentence. We thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know him better. Now, Don always said something to me. He said, if this book tells you to do something or I tell you to do something, it don't happen, call me up and bitch at me. So I called him up. I said, I'm confused. He said, about what? I said, I just sat and shared some absolute insane things and harm and guilt and shame and selfishness and fear with you over several hours about a lot of stuff. And this crazy book says I'm supposed to know God better. He said, don't you remember what the book says? As I reveal myself to him, he reveals himself to me. Wow. And all of a sudden, I begin to see how this process works. He uses another human being to allow me to reveal myself to God. And then he reveals himself to me. Goes on to say, taking this book down from the shelf, I turn to the page which contains the 12 steps. Carefully reading the first five proposals, I ask if I have omitted anything, for I'm building an arch through which I shall walk a free man at last. Is my work solid so far? Are the stones properly in place? Imagine if you're reading this and you didn't understand the second step's the cornerstone, the third step's the keystone. You'd say, what the hell are they talking about? Look at the next sentence. Have I skipped on the cement put into the foundation? 
have I tried to make mortar without saying? But you and I, based on the work we've done, we understand all those questions, don't we? So, I've now, and then top of page 76, if I can answer my satisfaction, these questions, now I'm done with step five, it says we then look at step six. Everything I can tell in my experience is that the sixth step is all about God as are the seventh. And only an alcoholic would want to pontificate upon God's word. There are two short, simple paragraphs here that are not difficult to understand. The sixth step really says we have emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Now I get two questions, and only a drunk would ask this next question. Am I now ready to let God remove from me all the things which I have admitted are objectionable? Think about that. You just did a fifth step, right? You got reams and reams of all these defects, and now you're going to ask, well, I don't know if I wanted to take it or not, right? It's what separates you from God. Here's another question, one of faith. Can he now take them all, every one? Well, in the second step, I made a decision he's everything. So I think he can. Now it says, if we still cling to something we'll not let go of, we ask God to help us be willing. Here's a point in time where I always tell people, are there some things you're unwilling to let go of? Well, what do you mean? Well, you keep telling me you got fear of abandonment. Are you willing to let go of that? Well, what does that mean? It means that if you want to let go of it and he removes it, you can't go to AA meetings anymore bitching about fear of abandonment. Do you want to experience that? Oh, hell, I never thought about that. <laughs> you know, things like, check this one out, masturbation. Watch the room shutter and get real quiet. Well, you might want to let go of that. Smoking cigarettes. Look at everything you're unwilling to let go of, right? Ken just said it to me outside. Damn it, I realized last night, Mark, there's a whole bunch of things I'm unwilling to do and unwilling to let go of right now. That's why they say in the sixth step, willingness is indispensable. When ready, meaning when I've answered those questions, we say something like this. My creator, I'm now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad, and I pray that you now remove from me Every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and to my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. Third step prayer had no amen. The amen is behind the seventh step prayer. Says we have then completed step seven. Now at that time, one would think they would get a little rest. Not true book says now we need more action without which we find that faith without works is dead so it says let's look at steps eight and nine and we're going to go through some pages in this book and we're probably going to smash a whole bunch of middle of the road solution you hear in Alcoholics Anonymous about making amends I could show you last year in Breckenridge Colorado over 200 people who have made every amend that they are consciously aware of. Every amend they're consciously aware of. There's a man sitting in this room that 11 months sober has finished every single amend that he is consciously aware of. It is possible to finish all of your amends. How much freedom do you want? So the book's saying, Mark, let's look at steps eight and nine. We have a list of all the persons we've harmed and to whom we're willing to make amends. We made that list when we took inventory. All those names in my resentment inventory, all those names on my sex inventory. And then I do one other thing. I ask God to show me any other people I've harmed that are not on any of my inventories. And he always shows me some. Says Mark, you made this list when you took inventory when you subject yourself to a drastic self-appraisal. Now we're going to go out to our fellows and we're going to repair the damage done in the past. We attempt to sweep away the debris which has accumulated our effort to live on self-will and to run the show ourselves. Here's a great cop-out for amends. If we haven't the will to do this, we ask until it comes. 
friend of mine tells a story I like. He's one of these guys that goes around doing guru shit every now and then. And and in this group, they can ask questions. So he shared one time in a meeting, he gets done. And he was talking about a men he had to make to a girl he was engaged to that he didn't want to make. And he made the mistake of saying in front of some other people that have done the work, I'm praying for the willingness to make this amend. And I'm asking until it comes. It hasn't come yet. And somebody from the audience says, is it possible? And he knew right away he was headed for trouble. He said, is it possible you're not praying for the willingness? He said, why, yes, I am. I'm praying every day. He said, well, I'll have you think about something. He said, I submit to you that the day that you're willing to make this amend, you'll know it and you'll know it very easily. He says, how's that? He said, you're going to hear a real strange noise. He said, what the hell are you talking about? He said, yeah, you're going to hear a real strange noise. He said, what's it going to sound like? He said, it's going to sound like this. That's you knocking at her door to make the amend. <laughs> People in AA say, well, I haven't made any amends in four months. I'm praying for the willingness. No, I agreed at the beginning to go to any lengths for victory over alcohol. We're going to be reminded of that in the next sentence in squiggly lines. Book tells us three times. Mark, are you willing to go to any lengths for victory over alcohol? Let me comment on that. There's not very many people in AA you can walk up to and ask them this question and get an answer. What does it mean to be willing to go to any lengths for victory over alcohol? I can give you that answer. It means go from the title page to 164 and do everything it says. That's exactly what it means. And in steps eight and nine, they remind you in squiggly lines what you agreed to, Mark. Now, Don gave me an exercise, and I'd never seen him give me something out of the book. Once I got done with all this list, he said, Mark, for simplicity's sake, get some three by five cards, take every single amend, and put it on the three by five card. Put the name, address, phone number, all relevant information. And then in the right hand corner, I want you to do something. I want you to go through and visualize yourself making an amend to every person. And if it feels comfortable, put a plus. And if it feels uncomfortable, put a minus. Now, I knew Don didn't tell me to do some stuff out of the book, and I didn't know where he came up with that. Well, he came up with that in the next sentence. Probably, Mark, there are still some misgivings. Misgiving means I'm uncomfortable making the amend. So I did that. Here's what it says. As I look over the list of business acquaintance and friends I have hurt, I may feel diffident about going to some of them on a spiritual basis. Let us be reassured. To some people, we need not and probably should not emphasize the spiritual feature on our first approach. We might prejudice them. At the moment, we are trying to put our lives in order. But this is not an end in itself. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be a maximum service to God and to the people about us. It is seldom wise to approach an individual who still smarts from our injustice to him and announce we've gone religion. In the prize ring, this would be called leading with the chin. Why lay ourselves open to be called brand and fanatics or religious bores? We may kill a future opportunity to carry a beneficial message. But our man is sure to be impressed with a sincere desire to set right the wrong. He is going to be more interested in demonstration of goodwill than in our talk of spiritual discoveries. Demonstration of goodwill, if I owe the money and he asks me to pay it back, I pay it back. You're going to find in the amends that the big book covers every kind of amend that you have to make. Financial, family, business. The people we hate, criminal offenses, everything we've ever done, any category, the big book is very specific about how to make that amend. You hear this in meetings, some of you probably heard this, what talks about when I make amends, I shouldn't do so if I'm going to harm others. And I've heard people saying, hey, hey I'm others. Bullshit. <laughs> that isn't in these pages. Nowhere. I hear this in AA, the greatest harm I ever did, I did to myself. Yeah, you did. You know how to fix it? Go out and make amends to all those people you screwed over. That's the greatest gift I ever gave myself. 
was when I had the day when I made the last amend I was consciously aware of. It's a day I wish everyone in this room could experience. It's a level of freedom that virtually few people in AA can talk about. Because they buy this crap about you can't finish all the amends. We've been talking about the power of God, haven't we? You have to make that you're consciously aware of. Some of them may take time. If you're like me, I'm a geographic drunk. It took me three and a half years to get back to the six states I had to get back to. I can tell you of a guy that when he put his amends cards together, he put them together by continents. And it took him two years. I can tell you of a, of a black guy in Los Angeles who had 350 amends and 250 of them were burglaries knocking and entering. You know how salesmen go around and make cold calls? You know what this kid did? He went into neighborhoods where he burglarized houses, knocked on the door, and told them why he was there. I broke into your house. I stole this. What can I do to make it right? He finished in two years, 350 amends, 250 of them were breaking and entering. That guy's so on fire of this program, he vibrates off the floor. It is possible to make, consciously make, all of the amends that you owe and that come to you. How much freedom do you want? This book and one other book I know are designed to transmit a spiritual experience. This in the Bible. The Bible talks real, real clearly about cleaning your stuff up with your brother. How free do you want to be? This is not in the book, but this is my experience. I don't have any future till I clean up my past. Let me say that again. I do not have any future till I clean up my past. What does that mean? It means if I owe money and screwed people over and don't pay them, I doubt if I'm ever going to do very well in that area. It means if I have personal relationships, people I've harmed and haven't cleaned them up, I'm probably not going to do very well in this area. That's my personal experience. My life changed after I consciously finished all amends for the first time. When I went through last year in 93 and all the amends I had to make, there are two I still have to make. Those are the dead people. I want to comment on that. This happens a lot. Some people say you can't make amends to dead people. Really? CNA, when you talk about stuff like this, about three-fourths of the room will say, oh, no, you can't do that. But there's going to be about a fourth of the room, people like myself will say, in God's world, anything is possible. And you can make amends to dead people. And you can write their letter of amends that you'd like to make if they still were alive, and you can go to their grave. I've made several. This summer, the second week in July, I'll fly back to Humble, Iowa, and I will go to my grandmother and great aunt's graves, and I will make amends at their grave site. In the world of the spirit, anything is possible. And the reason I do that is real simple, because that amend is sitting right down here, and I harmed those women, and I love them, and I want to be free of that. How much freedom do you want? Goes on to say, we do not use this as an excuse for shying away from the subject of God. When it will serve any good purpose, we're willing to announce our convictions with tact and common sense. Now, here's what's interesting. The question of how to approach the man we hated. How many of us in here have men or women we hate? Every hand needs to go up on this one. It may be he or she has done us more harm than we've done him. And although we've acquired a better attitude toward him, we're still not too keen about admitting our faults. Nevertheless, with a person we dislike, we take the bit in our teeth. It is harder to go to an enemy than to a friend. Now look at the promise. But we find it much more beneficial to us. We go to this person in a helpful and forgiving spirit, confessing our former ill feeling and expressing our regret. So the book has given us instructions about business acquaintances and friends, and now it's told us what to do about people we still hate. I had someone say this to the, me the other day. They said that they were told that they had to be free of the resentment toward this person before they could go make amends. That isn't what the book says. The book says, I may still hate this person. And, and I may not even have, a, I may have a little better attitude toward him, but I'm still not too keen about talking to him. Go make the amen. Goes further, and I'm getting more instructions. Under no condition do I criticize such a person or argue. We've passed out a form, and there's a very special format I follow when I make amends, and I've given that to you. 
says so simply, we tell them we'll never get over drinking until we've done our utmost to straighten out the past. Highlight utmost to straighten out the past. You know, I heard a man say from the podium one time, and this got to this got it was about trying to find people we've harmed in the past. He said, Are you really willing to go to any length? Do you ever consider hiring a private detective? Oh, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. It says, Mark, we will never get over drinking until we've done our utmost to straighten out the past. And I'll challenge some of you who've been in AA sitting in this room for a while. Get brutally honest about where you're at with all your men you're consciously aware of. And are you doing your utmost to straighten out your past? And if not, go back and look at your first step. It's as a result of the desperation, the first step, that I become willing to go to any length. Maybe you're not a real alcoholic. More importantly, how much freedom do you want? We're there to sweep off our side of the street, realizing nothing can be accomplished till we do so. Look what the book just says. Nothing can be accomplished until I sweep off my side of the street. Why do you think it tells us that? Why do you think it tells us that? Because we had to search fearlessly in steps four through nine and turn our will and life over to the care of God. I'll submit something to you. Those of you in this room, when you leave here, if you continue through this work, the, from the day you finish your last amends within one year, what will happen in your life will blow your mind. From the day you finish your last conscious amend, you track 12 months down the road, and what will happen to you will blow your mind. How much freedom do you want? His faults are not discussed. We stick to our own. If our matter is calm, frank, and open, will be gratified with the results. My experience show is what happened from this next sentence. Nine cases out of ten, the unexpected happened. Amends I thought would be horrendous went great. Quite frankly, when I look back, the worst worst experience I ever had, of course, for me, that just means it didn't turn out the way I wanted. Uh, going into it, when I looked at my card, I write how I've harmed these people, where I'm at fault, and I say a prayer and go make the amend. I didn't see much harm. This lady looked me dead in the eye and said, I don't ever want to see you again. I think that's real nifty. You're sober. I don't want you ever talking to any one of my family again. And I left. Went whining to Don. He said, did you do what the book asked you to do? Yeah. Then he said, you cleaned off your side of the street, Mark. That's all the book asked you to do. Now you need to follow what she told you to do. Goes on to say, sometimes the man we're calling upon admits his own fault, so feuds of your standing melt away in an hour. Rarely do we fail to make satisfactory progress. Our former enemies sometimes praise what we are doing and they wish us well. Occasionally they will offer assistance. It should not matter, however, if someone does throw us out of his office. We've made our demonstration, done our part, it's water over the dam. Now, next paragraph deals with owing money. Never understood. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand this next paragraph about owing money. I have guys come to me and said, I don't know what I'm going to do about these financial amends. Well, I don't know. Maybe the writing in your book changed. Let's see what the book says. Most alcoholics owe money. We do not dodge our creditors. Okay, so I'm not going to run from creditors anymore. Telling them what we're trying to do, we make no bones about our drinking. They usually know about it anyway, whether we think so or not. Nor are we afraid of disclosing our alcoholism on the theory it may cause financial harm. Approached in this way, the most ruthless creditors will sometimes surprise us. Arranging the best deal we can, we let these people know we're sorry. Our drinking's made us slow to pay. We must lose our fear of creditors no matter how far we have to go or we're liable to drink if we're afraid to face them. If you are afraid to face your creditors and you're living in fear, you're blocked from the sunlight of the spirit, you live there long enough, you'll drink alcohol. It's not that difficult. Did I like making them? No, I'm selfish and self-centered. When I pay back these financial amends, that's money I'd like to spend doing other stuff. But how much freedom do you want? So if you owe 10 people, 
money. You go to them and arrange the best deal you can. I had some, see, I'm an alcoholic. Here's what I want to do, right? I want to wait. Let's say I owe someone 2000 I want to wait till I can walk in there with $2,000 in crisp $100 bills and throw it down. God forbid if I sit across and tell you that I can only pay you $10 a month for the rest of my life. But the book says I arranged the best deal I can. That's what I did. Some of those amends I had to make, they were $10 a month. I make it. It's real clear what I do around my financial stuff. Now, once again, I told you this book would cover every single area. The next area of amends are areas where we committed a criminal offense. It says perhaps we committed a criminal offense which might land us in jail if it were known to the authorities. We may be short in our accounts and unable to make good. We've already admitted this in confidence to another person, but we are sure we would be imprisoned or lose our job if it were known. Maybe it's only a petty offense such as padding the expense account. Most of us have done that sort of thing. Ooh. Maybe we're divorced and we, we remarried, but we haven't kept up the alimony, number one. She's indignant about it, and she has a worn out for our arrest. That's a common form of trouble, too. Next paragraph has got a lot of instructions about amends. Although these reparations take innumerable forms, there are some general principles we find guiding. Highlight this paragraph. Reminding ourselves we have decided to go to any lengths to find a spiritual experience we ask that we be given strength and direction to do the right thing, no matter what the personal consequences may be. We may lose our position or reputation or face jail, but we are willing. We have to be. We must not shrink at anything. That's a pretty powerful paragraph, isn't it? Now, I'm also given instructions. Example. You were out there ripping and roaring, drinking and single. Now you come into AA, you get married, have a child. <coughs> you die, you're dying of untreated alcoholism, and God forbid, go to a meeting where some spiritual gunfighter's at. Walk up to him and make the mistake of ask him to do you the work, work with you. So you do the work up to this point in time. Now you owe a bunch of money, or maybe you got a criminal offense, but now you got a wife and child involved. So the root of my problems is I, I'm selfish and self-centered. So I need to use some discretion and think because this wife and child are now going to be affected by my financial amend, right? So now the book's going to give me instructions about that. It says, usually, however, other people are involved. Therefore, we're not to be the hasty and foolish martyr who would needlessly sacrifice others to save himself from the alcoholic pit. A man we know had remarried. Because of resentment drinking, he had not paid alimony to his first wife. She was furious. She went to court. She got an order for his arrest. He had commenced our way of life. He had secured a position and was getting his head above water. It would have been impressive heroics if he walked up to the judge and said, here I am. So it says, we thought. That meant he went and talked to somebody in the fellowship. We thought he ought to be willing to do that if necessary, but if he were in jail, he could provide nothing for either family. So we suggested that he write his first wife admitting his faults and asking forgiveness. He did, and he also sent a small sum of money. He told her what he would try to do in the future. He said he was perfectly willing to go to jail if she insisted. Of course, she did not, and the whole situation has long since been adjusted. Now, I mentioned the Internal Revenue Service. When I got sober and did this work for the first time with a real sponsor, I had seven years that I had not filed. The Internal Revenue Service does not like that. They like your money. So I went to a man, said, I'd like to talk about this. I don't know what to do. He said, well, I would suggest the first thing you do is you probably go to a CPA and have them put those seven years together. And when that's done, let's take a look at the damage and how much you owe, and then probably we need to sit down with you and your wife. So I did that. 
I took what information I could gather. He did the seven years worth of returns. We took a look at how much money I owed, and I sat down with the wife there. And he and I, well, we, here's why we needed to do that. Because it was a lot of money, and it meant a lot of money out of my check was going to have to go to the Internal Revenue Service to make this amend. Yet she's now my wife, and she's going to be affected. So I needed to know how she felt about that. She had been around this thing long enough to know that if I didn't make these amends, I was going to drink alcohol and a block from God. And she said, I support you in what you're going to want to do. So I brought her in on it. I also didn't lead with a chin. I didn't walk into the IRS and say, here I am. Help me. I went to a CPA and he did all that stuff. And he also gave me some wise instructions, which I'm glad he gave me. Like, Mark, once you do this, every now and then, just for grins, they're going to tap all your accounts. So if you never have over $50 in them and they tap it, don't worry about it. I've done that, been it means of AA. <laughs> the IRS hit my account and took $2,000. Never happened to me. Why? Because I listened to a man in the program and I followed his instructions. And they did. Till I got that taken care of two times, they hit my account. So I don't lead with the chin. There are people in AA who've had to make every kind of amend known to man. Go talk to them. Particularly if other people are involved, you need to talk to them. Okay? It says, before taking drastic action, which might implicate other people, we secure their consent. If we've attained permission, which I did, have consulted with others, which I did, ask God to help, and the drastic step is indicated, we must not shrink. This brings the story, a mind, a story about one of our friends. While drinking, he accepted a sum of money from a bitterly hated business rival, giving him no receipt for it. He subsequently denied having received the money, and he used the instance as a basis for discrediting the man. He thus used his own wrongdoing as a means of destroying the reputation of another. In fact, his rival was ruined. He felt he had done a wrong he could not possibly make right. If he opened that old affair... He was afraid it would destroy the reputation of his partner, disgrace his family, and take away his means of livelihood. What right had he to involve those dependent upon him? How could he possibly make a public statement exonerating his rival? Now here's what he did. He followed instructions. After consulting with his wife and partner, he came to the conclusion that it was better to take those risks than to stand before his creator guilty of such ruinous slander. He saw that he had to place the outcome in God's hands. The outcome of our men is in God's hands. Or that he would start drinking again and all would be lost anyway. He attended church for the first time in many years. After the sermon, he quietly got up and made an explanation. This would take some serious courage, wouldn't it? His action meant widespread approval. Today, he's one of the most trusted citizens of his town. This all happened years ago. Now it's going to move into another area called domestic troubles. Perhaps we're mixed up with women in a fashion we wouldn't care to have advertised. We doubt if in this respect, alcoholics are funnily much worse than other people. <laughs> I love this next sentence. But drinking does complicate sex relations in the home. After a few years with an alcoholic, a wife gets worn out, resentful, and uncommunicative. How could she be anything else? The husband begins to feel lonely, sorry for himself. He commences to look around the nightclubs of their equivalent for something besides liquor. Perhaps he's having a secret and exciting affair with the girl who understands. In fairness... <laughs> We must say she may understand, but what are we going to do about a thing like that? A man so involved often feels very remorseful at times, especially if he is married to a loyal and courageous girl who has literally gone through hell for him. Whatever the situation, we usually have to do something about it. Now, those of you who are going to have to make amends to wives or significant others as a result of this area, Please pay serious attention. If we are sure that our wife does not know, should we tell her? Not always, we think. I love this next one. If she knows in a general way we've been wild, 
Should we tell her in detail? Undoubtedly, we should admit our fault. She may insist on knowing all the particulars. She will want to know who the woman is and where she is. <laughs> or who the man is and where he is. We feel we ought to say to her that we have no right to involve another person. We are sorry for what we have done, and God willing, it should not be repeated. More than that, we cannot do. We have no right to go further. Though there may be justifiable exceptions, and though we wish to lay down no rule of any sort, we have often found this the best course to take. Our design for living is not a one-way street, it is as good for the wife as for the husband. If we can't forget, so can she. It is better, however, that one does not needlessly name a person upon whom she can vent jealousy. Perhaps there are some cases where the utmost frankness is demanded. Now, the next sentence, most important. No outsider can appraise such an intimate situation. If you are in a marriage, if there are men's to be made in this area, pay attention. No outsider can appraise such an intimate situation. Read the book. Talk. If you are in a marriage, if there are men's to be made in this area, pay attention. No outsider can appraise such an intimate situation. Read the book. Talk to your sponsor. Pray. And you do what comes to you. This is important. We're talking about the most intimate of all situations and the most terrible of all human emotions, jealousy. I think there's reasons the book says no outsider can appraise such an intimate situation. I've seen this go both ways. I've seen men who decided through this exercise the best thing was to not say a word to the woman about their affairs. And I've seen men who decided the best thing was to tell her about the affairs. And both of them came out fantastic. So no outsider can appraise this situation. It says it may be that both will decide the way of good sense and loving kindness is to let bygones be bygones. Each might pray about it, keeping the other one's happiness uppermost in mind. Keep it always in sight. We're dealing with that most terrible human emotion, jealousy. Good generalship may decide the problem be attacked on the flank rather than risk a face-to-face -face combat. If we have no such complications, there's plenty we should do at home. Sometimes we'll hear an alcoholic say the only thing he needs to do is keep sober. Certainly he must keep sober for there will be no home if he doesn't. But he is yet a long way from making good to the wife or parents whom for years he has so shockingly treated. Passing all understanding is the patience mothers and wives have had with alcoholics. Had this not been so, many of us would have no homes today or would perhaps be dead. And these next few sentences describes me and most drunks I've known. The alcoholic is like a tornado roaring his way through the lives of others. Hearts are broken. Sweet relationships are dead. Affections have been uprooted. Selfish and inconsiderate habits have kept the home in turmoil. We feel a man's unthinking when he says sobriety is enough. He's like the farmer who came out of a cyclone cellar to find his home ruined. To his wife he remarked, don't see anything the matter here, Ma. Ain't it grand the wind's not blowing? Page 83, and here's some real instructions that I can do on a daily basis for my family. For me, my family consists of my brothers and sisters in AA. So these are tools I can pick up in my daily meditation, in my interaction with them. Here's what it says. Yes, there's a long period of reconstruction ahead. We must take the lead. A remorseful mumbling, we are sorry, won't fill the bill at all. Let me say that again. A remorseful mumbling, we're sorry, won't fill the bill at all. Making amends is not about sitting across from someone saying, I'm sorry. We passed out a form, and when I make amends, I follow the same procedure. And it comes out of the book. I'm in a 12-step program for recovery. I will never get over drinking till I've done my utmost to straighten out my past. In my relationship with you, this is where I was at fault. I borrowed this $500 from you, told you I would pay it back, and did not. I slandered your names at times. I did this, I did this, I did this. When I get done talking about where I'm at fault, here's a question. Do you need to tell me 
how what I did harmed you. And then I shut up. And I listen. And they will tell you how your actions harm them. And then I ask another question. In addition to that, is there anything else I have ever done that has harmed you? And they will sometimes said yes. Now that you've mentioned it, this and this and this. And then I ask the most important question of all. What can I do to set things right between us to balance the books? And I shut up. And they tell me. And if it's moral and if it's legal, <laughs> I do it. Understand something about finishing amends. Finishing amends isn't just about the approach. It's about doing what's asked of you to do. For example, my sponsor, when he made amends to his mother, you know what she told him she wanted him to do? She said, I only wanted you to be happy. Since that day, every time his mother sees him, he's happy. Irregardless of what's going on in his life. Why? Because that's what she told him she wanted him to do to make amends to her. So he shows up at her house. He's happy all the time whenever he's around his mother. That's what we do when we make amends. What can I do to set this right? What can I do to balance the books? So it says, we ought to sit down with the family and frankly analyze the past as we now see it, being very careful not to criticize them. Their defects may be glaring, but the chances are our own actions are partially responsible. So I clean house with the family. Now I'm going to be given a spiritual tool. I ask each morning in meditation that my creator show me the way of patience, tolerance, kindness, and love. That's a prayer. If you have a family, and for me, I have an AA family that I can take into meditation every morning. The spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. We have to live the spiritual life. It's not a theory. Unless one's family expresses a desire to live upon spiritual principles, we think we ought not to urge them. We should not talk incessantly to them about spiritual matters. They'll change in time. Our behavior will convince them more than our words. We must remember that 10 or 20 years of drunkenness would make a skeptic out of anyone. It says there may be some wrongs we can never fully right. We don't worry about them if we can honestly say to ourselves, we would write them if we could. Some people cannot be seen. We send them an honest letter. And there may be a valid reason for postponement in some cases, but we don't delay if it can be avoided. We should be sensible, tactful, considerate, and humble without being servile or scraping. As God's people, we stand on our feet. We do not crawl before anyone. And that sums up the instructions on steps eight and nine. The book is highly, highly specific. And my experience is most of what I hear in AA around amends is not in this book. I don't think there's much doubt in any of our minds as we went through this together about this making of amends, is there? We must not shrink at anything. We must be willing to go to any lengths, willing to lose position, reputation. Now, I'll share this experience again. I could give you a lot of stories about amends and the incredible things that happened. But my experience, most of all, with all that, how free do you want to get? I don't have any future till I clean up my past. Amends are spiritual exercises. I shared this with a friend. Another reason I like to do the three by five cards. When I'm done, I put them in groups. Here's what the groups look like. Remember I said I put a plus or minus? I put I take all the minuses, the ones I, I don't want to do, and I put them here. All the pluses here. If I got some amends out of state, I put them here, and I put financial over here. Now I have four distinct groups. He said to Don, well, how do I get the willingness to make the ones the one I don't want to make? He said, by starting to make amends to the ones you're willing to make. And I did that, and I begin to see that this was kind of a neat deal. The other neat piece is as I make the amend, I can throw the card away. There are two times when I'm going through the steps that inanimate objects talk to me. One of them happens in inventory. I'm writing inventory, and I sit in my office, and I'm walking down, and I go to my bedroom at night, and I hear this thing out of the office. Mark, I'm your inventory, and I'm sitting in here, and I'm waiting for you. You ever had that happen with your inventory? It talks to you? Here's the other time. Here's why the amend cards are so neat. Those cards, three by five cards, you can carry with you. So you have them in your briefcase. 
You go to open your briefcase, go sit down back to your desk, and you hear this voice. Mark, I'm that guy you screwed out of $500. I'm here. The amend cards, if they're there, I'm carrying them with me all the time. You know why? We're going to read instructions. The day I begin to make a tent, amends, I begin to operate in steps 10 and 11, and my sole function is to finish amends. <coughs> if I make a list on an eight and a half, 11 by piece of paper, my experience in working with people, they may or may not look at that list once a month or, or once a week. But you get all these three by five cards, and you begin each day. When I started amends, my sponsor only had one question for me. When I saw him, it wasn't even a low. It was, how many amends do you have left? <laughs> I know this works. There's a lady sitting in this room that left here 60 days ago and started with like 65 amends. She's only got 22 left. I told you, there's a man sitting in this room. Went down to Trinidad. I love this when people say, well, I can't go make all the amends. His story's like one of hundreds. Hot the plane, spent his own money, went down to Trinidad and spent a month making every amend he was consciously aware of. I love this story. You guys will get a kick out of this. You know how they do amends on Trinidad because it's an island? When it comes time for amends, the sponsor comes and picks up the protege and takes him on every single amend. <laughs> wow. I'd love to have my sponsor with me. But think about that. That'd be kind of a neat deal. It is possible to finish all your amends. How much freedom do you want? Are you really willing to go to any length? There are levels of freedom in this program. And it does get down to how much freedom do you want? You will have more of a future as you clean up the past. Because the things that have you blocked from God and other people get removed from you. Are men's easy? No. Are they fun? No. Are they rewarding? Absolutely. To get free from your past. There's nothing like it in the world. The day when you finish the last of one. The absolute last one. And you know in your conscious memory... There's no harm left that you haven't attempted to clean up. Give you an idea. The book talks about, I'll send out an honest letter. Here's what I do on amends from the past, a long time ago. First of all, I try and find an address. If I can't find an address, I try and think, is there someone I know that knows them? If not, I can go to the library in the town I think they're living in and try and find them. And if I have a real old address, even if I know it's not any good, I write the letter and send the letter out to the universe. Then I've met the criteria of the book. I've done my utmost to make that amend. Some interesting things happen off that stuff. Uh, I think I'd like to stop. We're going to take a little break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to take a look at the promises, and then I'm going to show you some stuff with 10 and 11, okay? Oh, I'm Mark Houston. I'm an alcoholic. We are heading into the home stretch here. Uh, probably about another hour and a half, and uh, we will uh, we'll be finished here. Page uh, eighty-three, bottom of the page. We read. I stressed a lot the promises in the big book, and I did that because we read the first promise on the title page. We read some incredible promises in the second step. We read about a lot of promises after we made our third step decision. <clears throat> Some of the most powerful promises in the whole book come after I've shared my inventories with somebody. Fifth step promises. There were promises after the seventh step. And now we're going to take a look at the promises we get about what happens when I attempt to go out and clean up the wreckage from my past. So page 83, bottom of the page says, If I am painstaking about this phase of my development, I like the word painstaking. I will be amazed before I am halfway through. Now let me explain what halfway through means. If I have a hundred amends, it means that I will be amazed before I get to 50. <laughs> I have had different experiences. I have sometimes been amazed at what happens when I finish my cards. I have been amazed when I finished all of them, and I've been amazed when I'm halfway through, so I've had all different experiences. But here's some of the promises I get as a result of being paid, taking about this phase of my development, making amends. I'm going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. I will not regret the past, nor will I wish to shut the door on it. I will comprehend the word serenity, and I will know peace. No matter how far down the scale I've gone, I will see how my experience can benefit others. 
That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. I will lose interest in selfish things and I will gain interest in my fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. My whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave me. I will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle me. I will suddenly realize that God is doing for me what I could not do for myself. Sometimes when I, when I get to page 84, having had experience with all the promises in this book, uh, I'm overwhelmed by how much God loves me. We're not talking just little promises of you're going to have a nice day here. We're talking about being rocketed into the fourth dimension called the world of the spirit and literally every single area of your life being dramatically changed. And most of all, that interior change that takes place. Goes on to say, are these extravagant promises we think not? They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. That sentence might speak to me about how long I take to make amends. Next sentence I think is very important. These promises will always materialize if I work for them. We've been shown how to work for them, haven't we? Go make the amends. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.